In this video, we compare the 1948 and 1950 Superman movie serials to the 1941 Adventures of Captain Marvel serial. A superhero who was known as Captain Marvel, who said Shazam to get his powers, to a character who was named Shazam, to, in 2023, just being known as, uh, from now on, I guess, as the, the Captain. Just the Captain. I don't understand it. Definitely confusing. But for the remainder of this video, we'll just refer to him as Captain Marvel. We'll take a look at how each superhero's powers are shown on screen, along with the special effects used, which hero was more heroic, and much more, including a comparison of a few goofs. So get ready to go back in time when kids had to go to the theater to see a superhero in action, before every family in America had a television and comic books were still being read by millions, instead of a few thousand people a month. Now let's look at the superhero code of conduct. Everybody knows that Superman is sworn to never kill anyone, even bad guys. But in the comics, that wasn't always the case. Superman wasn't as concerned about inadvertently taking criminal lives as he would be a few years later, after his comic book adventures first began. By the time of the Superman movie serials, Superman was known for not taking human lives in the pursuit of justice. Captain Marvel, on the other hand, at least in the 1941 serial, not in the comics, he didn't really seem to care about killing bad guys. He didn't even blink. In fact, he was more like the Terminator than the super swell guy we know as Captain Marvel. Or whoever. His name is uh, Captain Sparkle Fingers. No, it's not. No, it's not. It's not, my, it's not my name. I mean, he was nice to good guys and all that. He just didn't waste any time showing mercy to villains. In part, I think this was due to the fact that his origin was slightly altered in this version. In his serial, Billy Batson was given the powers to defend and protect the Scorpion Idol. Everything he did was to that end. He was all serious business, like a force of nature, or as I mentioned already, the Terminator. And it absolutely will not stop, ever! You might even be tempted to ask yourself, is this Shazam's Captain Marvel or the Punisher? On the other hand, Superman sometimes even smiled while he was whooping up on the bad guys, making being a superhero look like fun. This scene, one of the best from the Superman serials, truly a classic, illustrates that point. Now when you think about it, there's nothing really more cooler than a guy who's so tough that he beats up bad guys with a smile as if the bad guys weren't even enough of a challenge to work up a sweat over. So I think in this respect, Kirk Allen's Superman betrayal is a little more fun to watch over actor Tom Tyler's super serious Captain Marvel, even though I found both superheroes very entertaining to watch. They were both a lot better than the Batman movie serial that came out in 1943 I just finished. I'll probably have to do a video on it later. I'm going to watch the next Batman movie serial and see if they improved from the last one. As far as the Superman flying scenes and the way they use 2D animation instead of wires or something similar, it is tempting to question their choice here. But you get used to it. And for the kids that were watching at the theaters back then, must have seemed like a neat combination of live action and the comic book Superman come to life. The scenes do actually flow well together. You do notice that Superman is always landing behind a rock or something to hide the transition. Sometimes from cartoon to live actor, not always though. As for why they used animation, Kirk Allen said in the interview that they tried to use wires but they couldn't get it to where you couldn't see them. In the second serial, they did start to do like close-ups of Allen where he's standing with smoke clouds and and fans going to make it look like he is flying. And they did this in addition to the animated Superman flying. And what do we use now for many superhero scenes? Glorified 3D cartoons we call CGI, which is nothing more than a more realistic cartoon that is generated by computers instead of being hand drawn. Not to knock either one. I mean, I think it's important to remember the beginnings of every technology. We didn't just wake up one day with cell phones or television sets, for example. Everything we have today was obtained gradually through progress handed down from one generation to the next. But I'm going to have to give the advantage here to Captain Marvel and the methods used to bring his flying powers to the screen, even though those effects were actually older by about seven years. Flying was done by blending three different methods together. First, there were scenes where Tom Tyler was on wires with a projected sky behind him in conjunction with a wind and fog machine. Wires are visible in some scenes more than in others. In the other method, Captain Marvel flies sometimes with the aid of a dummy on the string. This method was created by Howard and Theodore Lidecker 
and was performed using a dummy that was slightly larger than life at 7 feet tall and made of paper mache so it weighed only 15 pounds. The uniform was made of thin silk and cotton. It would slide across two wires from one end of the camera's view to the other, making it look like Marvel himself was flying from one side to the other side. This system was originally intended for use in the Superman serial that Republic never got to do. A prototype dummy was even built, but later discarded. If the dummy needed to fly upwards, the dummy would be slid backwards, and then they would reverse the film so that it would look like it was flying up. It does work pretty well in most scenes. I think the only thing that gives it away in some cases is when they get the camera a little too close. Um, I think maybe if they had made the dummy instead of seven feet tall, exactly uh, Tom Tyler's height, maybe it would have worked just a, just a tiny bit better, but it was still a, a pretty good effect. Now let's look at how each movie serial did the bullets bouncing off the chest bit. Just as they used animation for the flying scenes, it appears that they used animated bullets for the Superman serials, which doesn't look bad at all. In this clip, I slowed it down just a little bit and zoomed in so you could see the bullets a little more clearly. It looks like for Captain Marvel that maybe they used some kind of a squib packet hidden in his costume that blew out smoke. In newer movies later on, these squib packets would shoot out fake blood. If you've ever noticed in some of the 70s movies that the fake blood always looked like red paint. For sheer realism, I have to go with Captain Marvel on this one. I like both versions, but Captain Marvel is, a, it was a little bit more realistic, I think. Looking at the stunt work for both of the movie serials, Kirk Allen claimed to do his own stunts. Republic used the amazing David Sharp to pull off some really superhuman level acrobatics. In Chapter 2, the first Superman serial, the first appearance of Superman has him holding a broken rail together so the train containing Lois and Jimmy can pass safely. Now don't brush this scene off as no big deal. You see the amazing part is that the special effect here is really Kirk Allen himself. He said this in an interview years later. They tried using a stuntman stand in for me in the beginning, but once they previewed the rushes, they decided that the audience would never believe this guy was me. He didn't look like me, move like me, or act like me. So they asked me, if I minded doing the stunts myself, I said, sure, I'll do them. That's where all the fun was anyway. In one scene, I was positioned 18 inches from a railroad track with a train barreling by at 90 miles an hour. Now, if you don't think that's scary, nothing is. If the slightest thing had gone wrong, it would have been all over for me. It was a very dangerous scene to shoot. I was supposed to be holding the track in place so the train could zoom by safely. I had to hold it long enough for the train to pass, and the train never slowed down. Moreover, I had to pose for the cameras at just the right angle. Fortunately, the train whizzed by me before I knew what was happening. Stuntman David Sharp was very important in selling the flying ability of Captain Marvel. Dressed as Captain Marvel, he would leap from a high point as if he were flying and then he would roll with his landing at the very last second. He performed other stunts as well, such as backflipping and knocking down bad guys. I think David Sharp would have been an awesome Spider-Man. Alan was in top physical condition. Apparently most of the time Alan had to carry real people and make it look effortless. Just when he was carrying real people and when he was carrying mannequins it's hard to tell sometimes, but he had this to say about it. In one bit, I was supposed to turn into a flaming building, pick up these two people, and carry them off to safety. Well, I picked each one up in a different arm. We did a couple of takes, but for one reason or another, they had to shoot the scene several times. After a while, our director, Spencer Bennett, came over to me and said, That was good, Kirk, except I saw the veins in your neck puff out a little bit. You, you seem to be straining. Damn it, Spence, I said. This is about the eighth time we shot this scene. You try to carry real people eight times. They're not dummies, you know. He got totally flustered. Oh, geez. You're not supposed to carry real people. Where are the mannequins? Bring out the dummies. Tom Tyler was a real-life strongman, a weightlifting champion. According to oldtimestrongman.com, Tom Tyler was the 1928 AAU heavyweight lifting champion and first American to clean and jerk 300 pounds in an AAU competition. That must be a trick of some kind. Now how many actors do you think today could lift 300 pounds over their head? 
Maybe The Rock. That's the first one that pops in my head. I, I don't know. Now, heat vision was not on display in the movie serials of Superman. Superman used x-ray vision to heat things up starting in 1949 in the comics. You can see this on occasion on the Adventures of Superman TV series. But it wasn't until 1961 we even got a mention of the word heat vision in the comic books. Of course, Captain Marvel didn't have x-ray vision or heat vision, but most of his powers were basically like Superman's, only they had more, I guess, supernatural or magical origins. Shazam! Of course, Billy Batson had a much cooler way of turning into a superhero than Clark Kent did. Shazam! Poor Clark Kent had to do it the hard way. He always had to hide behind a cabinet or a car or something and change clothes. Now it's time we look at a couple of goofs. In this scene, Captain Marvel has to lift a big tree out of the way so his friends can get their car passed before a bomb explodes. Well, apparently a crew member was uh, worried about whether or not Captain Marvel could pull this off or not, and he had to sneak a peek. So if this doesn't hurt Captain Marvel, and this is no big deal for Captain Marvel, then how is Captain Marvel getting knocked down by nothing more than a chair? Why doesn't that guy answer? One thing that aggravated me was that Billy Batson was always waiting too long to say Shazam, or Captain Marvel was always saying Shazam too soon when there was still stuff going on. Okay, technically this wasn't a goof. It was more like Billy Batson just had a lot of pride because he was young, I guess, and he didn't need the power of Captain Marvel. He could do it all himself, right? Tell me the secret, and Miss Wallace goes free. Well? But there is one thing that definitely bugged me, is that Billy Batson was always getting gagged so he couldn't say Shazam. Even when other people were captured, and they weren't gagged. It, it just didn't make any sense. Tell me the secret, and Miss Wallace goes free. Well? Well, good luck getting an answer out of him. Well, let me divert your attention just for a second to a newer goof from the newer movies that just kind of bugs me, and I figure I might as well talk about it while I'm talking about, you know, Captain Marvel. Who are you? His name is Thundercrack. Come on, guys, this isn't that hard. Captain Marvel. Yes. Yeah, his name is, uh, Captain Sparkle Fingers. No, it's not. No, it's not. It's not my, that's not my name. And I wouldn't be here right now if Captain Marvel hadn't rescued me. Captain Marvel! Captain Marvel! It's my sidekick, Captain Every Power Jr. Hey! Wonder if that was deliberate. You're the best, Captain Marvel. Yeah, go high voltage. Well, at least somebody knows his name. See, the thing is, at the end of the movie, the second new movie, they decide that his name is Shazam, which makes no sense. I mean, what if somebody asks Captain Marvel, what is your name? And he says Shazam, and he turns right back into Billy Batson, right in the middle of an emergency. Or right in front of everybody, and there goes his secret identity. Sorry to get distracted. Let me say one more thing, and then we're right back on topic. Uh, let me say that uh, Zachary Levi is fun to watch, as whoever it is that he's playing when he's supposed to be playing Captain Marvel. Call this next one a goof or just an interesting detail. When Billy Batson rams into a bad guy and they go over the bridge, it's obvious they use dummies at least for the bad guy for sure because he looks really stiff. And this goof happened really quickly. It'd be very easy to miss. It looks like Cat Marvel has actually lost his balance, which a super powerful superhero like that probably wouldn't do in real life. Well, if superheroes were real. In chapter 11, Jimmy Olsen hides from crooks in a wooden box on a truck. And at the end of the chapter, two crooks come out and fill the box full of lead. In chapter 12, it's actually Superman that's in the box. But now it's only one crook firing into the box instead of two. In Chapter 9, Lois Lane and company are casting shadows on a photo backdrop that's supposed to be real buildings. Oh, yes, we've been looking for you. Also in Chapter 9, it appears that Clark is using his x-ray vision to see through a man's disguise in a photo. 
Obviously, if this is what they are going for, that would be impossible, as photos only capture what's on the surface, not what's underneath. Although, in all fairness, maybe this was meant as some sort of super deductive ability, rather than the use of x-ray vision. At the end of chapter 13 and the beginning of chapter 14, Superman leaves a bad guy with Perry White with no one else around to keep the bad guy in check, and the bad guy isn't even handcuffed. Of course, Superman had the intent of returning shortly, but I just knew that Perry was going to get in, in a trouble, and sure enough, he gets thrown out on the ledge. I built it for one purpose, to dispose of Superman. Adam Man's uh, whole look was just, it, it was a goof. I mean, it looks like somebody put a bucket on her head, put holes in it, and sprayed glitter all over it. Blindfold him. Oh well, what have I got to lose? In the Adaman vs. Superman, Jimmy Olsen is blindfolded by the Adaman. But there's no logical reason as he's going to send Olsen back to the Daily Planet Star Trek style, as he's transported back to the Daily Planet instantaneously. So how could Jimmy possibly see the location of Adaman's lair? In Chapter 11 of Adaman vs. Superman, Clark, Lois, and Jimmy are locked in a room filled with gas. Clark waits until Lois and Jimmy are already passed out before he acts like he has succumbed to the gas and pretends to fall to the floor. They're already passed out, so there's no reason for him to pretend at this point. Then he suddenly jumps up and inhales the gas. I suppose it was a trick to get the audience uh, in the previous chapter to thinking Superman was actually being affected by the gas. There's a couple of times in these serials where Superman stops a train that are worth looking at. I wouldn't call them mistakes by the way they accomplished this trick because there was literally no other way to do it back then, I wouldn't think. But it's easy to see how they accomplished these scenes. As you can tell, it's a film in front of Kirk Allen, and then they switch to a real train that is completely stopped. Now here's the second time you did it. I to me, this one isn't as convincing, but you look at it and you, you put in the comments, what do you think? Which train scene is more convincing, the first one or the second one? I don't know, in the second one, I keep thinking the train looks like it's way too big as compared to Superman size, but what do y'all think? Now, if we want to get technical, it could still be a goof if you consider that stopping a train so suddenly in real life could probably cause the train cars to pop off the tracks and cause a whole lot of damage. But, you know, hey, it is a superhero movie. According to what I read, Tom Tyler went through a lot of strenuous jobs before he got his break in Hollywood. He was a boxer, lumberjack, coal miner, different, various strenuous type work. Uh, he was born Vincent Markowski. Of course, not only did he play Cat Marvel, he also played the Phantom in the serial The Phantom 1943. He appeared in five films with John Wayne, and he was also the mummy in The Mummy's Hand in 1940. He appeared in a lot of westerns. Now sadly, according to IMDB's bio of Tom Tyler, he got rheumatoid arthritis, which crippled him within three years of having starred in Captain Marvel. But he was able to play in many supporting roles until he had to go live with his sister, where he died of a heart attack at the age of 50 in 1954. It's such a tragic thing to happen to a man who, who took his physical fitness so seriously. Frank Coughlin Jr., who played Billy Batson, was a popular child actor. When he was older, he appeared with Shirley Temple in Merrily Yours and Pardon My Pups. Oh, there's one thing I forgot to ask y'all earlier. Does Billy Batson remind you of Jerry Matters on the Leave at the Beaver show? Or was it just me? My name is... All is known to me. Billy's even got a friend named Whitey, just like on Leave at the Beaver. I don't understand it. Anyways... After starring in Captain Marvel in 1941, Coughlin became a naval aviator in World War II. He later headed the Navy's Motion Picture Cooperation Program, acting as a liaison between the Navy and the Hollywood studios. After 23 years in 1965, he returned to acting. He went on to appear in conventions where fans lined up to see the old Billy Batson. He even did a cameo appearance on the Shazam TV series in the 70s on the season one episode, The Braggart. Uh, it's abandoned now, but we sometimes use it as a holding area for new animals. Hop in, I'll drive you over. Sadly, he died in 2009. It's may I come in, and the answer is yes, you're in. 
The first time we see actress Noelle Neal as Lois Lane, she's on a doomed train, and this becomes Superman's first rescue in costume. It's kind of coincidental that Kirk Allen and Noelle would appear in the Superman movie on a train together. Unfortunately, they cut that scene from the original theatrical release, but thankfully it was restored for the extended version. Uh, Lois, please read your book. Of course, Noelle would go on to play Lois Lane again on the TV series of the 50s, starting with the second season. Jimmy Olsen was played by Tommy Bond. Bond seemed to be wanting to play Olsen as a tough guy. And it's no wonder because he was most famous as the bully, Butch, on The Little Rascals. Of course, they say in real life he was a gentle soul, but you can't fool me. I'll see that you do land in jail. Now finish, mister. You can take it from me. Unfortunately, Jimmy Olsen got knocked out more times on this serial than any other character I can think of. In real life, Olsen would have had permanent brain damage from all the concussions. Tommy Bond didn't do a whole lot of acting after the Superman serials. He worked more behind the scenes in prop management, directing, and he worked at TV stations around LA. According to his biography on IMDb, he actually turned down the chance to play Jimmy Olsen on the 50s TV series. If that is true, it surely would have changed the tone of the series dramatically. Now get out, all of you, and find Hackett, and don't come back until you do. Get out, all of you! Watkin was hired to take over the role of Perry White on Adventures of Superman, the TV series, after John Hamilton died in 1958. But when George Reeves died shortly after Watkin was hired, the show was canceled. And, however, his second stint at being Perry White wouldn't have lasted long as he himself died in 1960. He did, however, make four appearances on Adventures of Superman as different characters. Kirk Allen definitely looked like Superman. I can't think of another actor that looked more like Superman apart from Christopher Reeve. He did have a couple of quirks, like looking both ways before he committed himself to any direction. <laughs> Allen comes across, though, as, as very wholesome, the way you expect Superman to be. He looked like he was having fun, though, and that's 90% of what makes a movie or a show fun to watch. You can just feel it when the actors aren't enjoying themselves. As to why Alan didn't take the role of Superman on the TV series, he said uh, this in an interview. When they shot the second serial, they discussed the possibility of a television series with me. The casting director asked me if I wanted to do the TV series, but in a manner that discouraged me from doing it. You know, Kirk, now we can't pay you a lot, and we don't know if it'll catch on or not, and... So I said, well, if you don't know how well it'll do, then there's no sense in prolonging the uh, agony. I've got enough troubles anyway. I'm going back to New York. Well, and that was the end of uh, what he said on the interview about that. It sounds to me like he was trying to say that they were just trying to completely discourage him from taking the role. Their version of Lex Luthor appears to have influenced John Byrne's 80s Lex Luthor in the comics. In the uh, John Byrne comics revamp, they turned Luthor into an evil businessman who wore a suit and tie. Now this uh, movie version is both a genius and an evil businessman who owns a TV station. Luther was played by Lyle Talbot, who did a pretty serious, no-nonsense kind of Luther. Coincidentally, he also played Commissioner Gordon in the 1949 Batman and Robin serial. Want more stuff on Superman? On TV Crazy Man, I've got some good Superman goofs from television, questions answered on the adventures of Superman, Super Friends goofs, and lots of other cool TV superhero stuff. This is the channel for reliving the good old days. If you would, please subscribe if you haven't already. Hit the bell for future notifications so you don't miss any more videos later on. Uh, let me know what you thought about this video. It really helps. I love to read comments. And please hit the like because that helps the video out and more people see it. Thanks. And if you like cartoons, check out my Freddy Cat Cartoons channel for a mix of new and classic cartoons. The new being my own cartoon creations like Claw the Kung Fu Cat. I appreciate a view of my latest video with Claw and Papa. Thanks again and have a great day. Ah, 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 ah.